We're entering into this new series um, entitled Stuck because there's no better place to think about what it is to get stuck in life. And we're all stuck in certain places, points along the way. We're going to look at that every week throughout the summer. Uh, no better place to go than the story of Joseph, right? Hey, I'm curious. So it all starts tomorrow, as TJ noted, VBS. Let's go. How many of you, I'm curious, how many of you um, went to VBS when you were a kid? Anybody? Like, maybe not all of us, but a bunch of us did, right? I mean, we, wasn't it just good memories, I hope? Um, I, I remember just hanging out, you know, doing crazy songs, singing about Jesus, all this stuff, uh, playing with friends. Snack time was so legit. Um, but a lot of uh, just, you know, I, I know it was during that time that I was learning a lot about the Lord as a little kid and really helped uh, shape my life. And so the 200 volunteers we have, all of you, many of you here, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you want to say, well, how can I invest? I'm kind of a late uh, adopter here, you can find us after the service, see if we can put you in a spot, perhaps, because there's plenty of, of space and, and people needed to disciple children, because that's what we do. Um, we're raising up the next generation to follow Jesus. But we live in this, um, we live in this, in, a, in an era that's been called extended adolescence, that many people do, not just, um, not just younger people, but if I were to say to you, um, yeah, you have great memories, maybe when you were like in elementary age, you know, school, and, 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 and how many of you are like just exactly where you were spiritually at that time, you're just still there now? Like, you, nobody wants to admit that, right? And yet, physically, think about it, when a child is not growing, something's wrong. Like, we take him to the doctor. Like, something's not, up, not, not right here. And yet it's possible for us to be spiritually immature, stuck in certain areas of our lives, and we think, well, it's just kind of normal. Like everybody does that. When in actuality, yes, I suppose everybody does that to some degree, but we are to get unstuck, okay? This extended adolescence, kind of a perpetual Peter Pan in Neverland. We're just trying to, some people, like I just want to stay young forever. And the others of us are stuck and we're having a hard time growing up. And the scriptures over and over again, Paul does this throughout the epistles. He's saying to, to you know, early believers and to us, grow up. James says the same, grow up. And the challenge for us today is that I want us to grow up because we are going to start this series um, and think about Joseph's life because early on, as we set the context, everybody in the story is immature. You can go ahead and grab your Bible if you want to, as we're thinking about being, uh, getting, getting uh, really stuck in maturity, okay, in immaturity. We're going to talk about that today. You can, you can grab your Bible, turn to Genesis 37 is where we're going to be. Um, some of you uh, know, or maybe you've read that um, nowadays this extended adolescence, and I'm, just, I'm not going to just bust on our young adults here, but now 25 is the new 18. Some of you know this, right? Like, you're not even out of school, not figuring, you don't know what you're doing. Um, some have said 30 is the new 20, um, because now a lot of milestones that formerly were things that, that you know, young people did are being delayed. People are, are being delayed in terms of marriage, not that that's the, the goal in life, but people are delaying having children. People are delaying really finding their place and what they do. We have the side hustle, and then we don't know what we're doing, where, again, a former generation was said, I got this degree, I'm going to do this, and here I go, I'm diving in, I'm now the company person, and I'm on track here. Um, it's a different world, and I know that. But I have a theory as well that I think that we are stuck in this extended adolescence because of an identity crisis. Some of you know Eric Erickson, who did a lot of work, um, psychologist, around uh, stages of development. He's the one who established that term. Um, and I think that we're stuck in identity crisis. He, he called this extended adolescence psychosocial moratorium adolescence. Just a big term that moratorium is, is delayed payment, delayed responsibility. And I think what happens is a, a lot of times young people in our, in our world today, in fact, if you grow up um, with everything in the world telling you there are no absolutes, you, you can define your own, you know, pathway and who you are. And this creates an identity crisis because if it's subjective, we've talked about this a lot. If it's, if it's on me, that is a life filled with anxiety, filled with indecision. 
and, 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 and filled with, without purpose because we have no outside authority saying, this is what your life is all about. This is who you are. Your identity is found in God who loves you, who's created you for a purpose. If you don't have that, no wonder you're lost in this perpetual extended adolescence. But the thing is, this can continue on as we get older and older. And we're going to see this in the life of Joseph. And so we're going to, again, we're going to talk about what it is to be stuck in, in immaturity. Because many of us, maybe you've been Christians for decades, and, and some of us, we seem incapable of moving past the basics of the faith. And that's not God's fault. We partner with him. And so today, I'm going to just say it up front. I'm going to bring a lot of challenges to you today. Uh, we talk about this in our preachers' meetings and preparations for sermons. We don't want you to leave on every Sunday morning and go, man, I got to work harder. I got to get better. Gosh, this is a beat down. I need, you know, who wants more of that, right? That's not what this message is about. The message, we're going to end with the Lord's Supper because it's a reminder that everything we do is in response to his grace. His love for us. You are loved today by the Lord. And I'm going to hit on some things where you're going to go, ooh, that's me. Oh, darn, that's my family. Ah, my family jacked up like that. And ooh, that hurts. But I want you to, to hear it from a, from a pastor's heart of love for you. I want to speak some hard truth for us today because many of us, we need to get unstuck. Many of us ought to be leading and we're not. Many of us should be way past an immature state where we're saying, everybody feed me. Everybody feed me. I'm just a big baby is what I am. Just a spiritual infant is what Paul calls him in Ephesians 4. I'm just, in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews talks about that. I'm just a baby. Give me milk. I'm not ready for solid food. And many of us here today, friends, many of us need to grow up and we need to decide, I now, I don't need to just come and sit. Maybe, maybe it's here at church. I'm just going to come sit. Just give me more of this. And you've been doing this for decades. Instead, you ought to be leading. Paul noted this in Ephesians and other churches. He said, you ought to be way past this by now. You should be now discipling others. You should be pouring into others. You should be, yes, you should be helping perhaps at VBS. I'm not putting a guilt trip on anybody. What is your ministry? Many of us need to hear this today because it's time to grow up. And it's why we often wonder, is God really with me? What is, you know, what is my life about? Why do I have so many doubts? What am I doing? Because you're not involved in the flow of what he's doing in your, in your world. And, and if you're not growing, become more and more like Christ, I could argue that you're not a Christian. I mean, that, you're not a disciple. And we've said recently, it's, it's possible to self-identify as a Christian in our culture today, we're seeing a lot of that and not be a disciple of Jesus. And he's calling us to be disciples. So I want us to see in this story of Joseph how today we're going to talk about, again, being stuck in immaturity. Because at the beginning of the story, everybody is stuck. Now, this past Friday, we read, you read this passage, um, Genesis 37 Verses 1 through 11. Now, before we get there, I want to say this. Um, as we grow up holistically, uh, spiritually, this doesn't always coincide with age. This past week, and I'm still just so undone by all this, but I um, saw the Petersons here this morning in the earlier service. Paul and Micah, uh, their son, Pike, passed away, and we celebrated his life this week. Pike, at 14 years old, lived uh, a life devoted to Christ. He, he lived more in his 14 years than many do for decades beyond him. He had a faith in the Lord that was beyond his years. I mean, it was uncanny. He told uh, Taylor Lowry, our student pastor, um, they, they were texting back and forth. At one point, he's in the hospital. He's got this diagnosis. He says, hey, I've been talking to my mom. And um, we were talking about how, you know, Joy in Christ is found not in our circumstances, but it's found in him. And he's always at work. And then 14-year-old Pike, he, he, he texted this. I'm going to get so much joy out of this. I'm going to get so much joy out of this. But how, how do you come to that? Maturity in Christ is not always attached to an age. It is attached to 
to surrender. It's attached to, Lord, I just want to give you my life. And I want you to grow me up. So less of me, more of you. And so many of us are following after, you know, our favorite commentary on the news, a favorite politician or something. We're trusting in our professions and our possessions, and we're not following after Christ. And therefore, the fruit of the Spirit is not being developed in our lives. And many of us, we should be way past where we are right now. And I'm, again, I'm just letting the Spirit fall there and let it convict us because Pike has shown us how to live and, and how to die. And, and, and if mature, here's the point. If maturity is the goal, is it? That's the question worth pondering. If maturity is the goal, then you will live like that. Like, Lord, whatever comes my way, whatever plans you have, as we sang a moment ago, you have good plans for me. So, so whether it, 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 it's in the, the desert, whether it's in the garden, you are at work in my life. Is maturity in Christ the goal of your life? If you are a Christian, if you're a disciple, that is the goal. To become more and more like him, okay? Now, another thing to point out while we dive into this whole series for the summer is that the Bible doesn't lay out 10 chapters, five points in each chapter. Take these steps and you become mature. Doesn't happen that way. Now, Proverbs and other places has some teaching like that, but most of it is narrative form. And this, of course, is in the book of Genesis and much of the Old Testament, much of the New Testament, the gospel is in narrative form. Why is that? Because life is a story. Your life is a story. My life is a story. We find, like, like we love movies, like we love books. We, we enter into the story and we find ourselves in the same story where we find Joseph. And so we can identify, but there's a lot that needs to be unpacked in the midst of that. And that's what we're going to do every week. I want you to also be reminded that the Bible doesn't spin the weaknesses and failures of its heroes. Because as we've talked about many times, there, there, there are no heroes in the Bible. There's one hero. It's God every time, and it's Jesus explicitly expressed. He's the hero. Moses was a murderer. You probably know this. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Noah got drunk, and Jonah was a racist. There's no other way to to talk about that particular story. Jacob, as we'll see, he was a liar. He was a deceiver. He's Joseph's dad, okay? This is jacked up from the start. Elijah burned out. You might know Jeremiah was depressed, even suicidal. Thomas doubted. Peter rebuked the Son of God, God in the flesh. John Mark abandoned Paul. I mean, we see it over and over again where you go, who, in particularly the Old Testament, the whole storyline is, oh, there's, now there's David. Yes, ooh, not David. Eesh. You know, even before them, Abraham, yeah, he's chosen. Come on, let's go. Oh, he's messed up. Isaac is the guy. Nope. Jacob need to have this generational stuff that keeps going. We're looking for the hero. And we're wondering, when is he going to come? That's what the Old Testament is about. But I just want to give you freedom today to say, you know what? I'm not the hero either. I want to be super mom. I want to be super dad. I want to be the super friend or whatever else. But gosh, I keep failing. I keep, I'm stuck. I keep tripping up on the same things over and over again. And I just want you to hear this today. God loves you and his spirit is speaking to you. And and your sin, your failure, it, it doesn't repel him. It triggers him toward you because that's who he is. He's a God of love and that's what he does. So today, if you're taking notes, if you have your journal or you want to write this down in your some journal or something you have, I'm at three points today. Uh, freedom reveals our immaturity. Our freedom reveals. And we're going to talk about how we handle our freedom. Our speech reveals our immaturity. Okay, and then thirdly, we'll get there. Our silence reveals our immaturity. First, our freedom reveals our immaturity. All right, now this should be self-evident, how we handle the freedom that we're given. Um, some of us need to put some li- accept some limitations in our lives. Here we go, verse one. The long summer uh, throughout the story of Joseph begins now. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojourning. So it, it, the previous chapter, by the way, lays out Esau's kind of genealogy. Here's what happened with Esau's family. Now, it, now it's kicks to Jacob. Remember, those, those two are, are twins, um, brothers. 
Okay, so Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojourning in the land of Canaan. This is the Holy Land, all right? These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, so it starts with Joseph. Being 17 years old, was pasturing um, the flock with his brothers. Now, these are half-brothers. Jacob had, how many sons did Jacob have? Anybody? Twelve, good. A little stronger than the first hour, but not by much. Okay. All right. There's grace for that. Okay. Um, Joseph, he's 17. So he's young. He's, I mean, he's immature. I said it, not attached to age, but he's not very old, not been through a lot. He's pastoring with his half-brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zelpha, Zelpah, his father's wife. So these are two slay, um, servants, okay, of, of Rachel. So Rachel's servant was Bilhah. Leah's servant was, was Zilpah. Okay, you remember that Jacob's wife, well, he had Rachel, whom he loved, right? And then he had Leah, right, this kind of servant gal, because he had, couldn't have children with Rachel. So she, R- Leah has six kids. These two servants have two each. And then uh, Rachel later then has two. Rachel has Joseph and then the youngest, who is, what's his name? Come on, let's go. All right. But already, can I say it? This family's jacked up. Already jacked up. With all this going on here, and Joseph, then he's out there with his half brothers, and he brought a bad report uh, of them to their father. Now, the storyline behind this is important. Jacob's family is growing numerically, but they are not growing spiritually. It's possible to get older and not grow up. It's possible to have this family, yay, I got grandkids, and not even be growing spiritually, which is the most important thing. This family is a mess. Um, because what we see in Jacob's family growing up with, with Isaac and Rebekah, you might remember Isaac loved Esau, Jacob loved, uh, um, I mean, uh, Rebekah loved Jacob. So you got parents who are like, I love that kid. No, I love this kid, right? And there's deception. You might remember with the blessing, all of this. And, it, and now it's going to continue in Jacob's life. I talk to so many people, like young, you know, couples maybe getting married, and they're like, man, my, our parents, they were so messed up, or my parents got divorced, or whatever else, and, and, but that ain't happening in my family. My, my family's going to be different. And I'm like, yes, and yes, you can break the patterns that have been the patterns of your past, even the, the sins or failures of your parents, you can break those patterns. But often I wonder... You might know what not to do, but how have you seen what it looks like to actually do the right thing? Have you seen a mom and dad loving each other well? Have you seen families that persevere and stay in? Have you seen it? And this is what the church is all about as well. We come around each other and we love each other, but you've got to be involved in community to experience that. It's in community, right? What we're going to see here is nobody steps in. Jacob is passive. He does not step in to help Joseph along the way as a kid. And it's amazing that Joseph ends up getting unstuck along the way as he does. So Jacob grew up desperately lacking the love of a father. There's so many, uh, there's so many parts here. Um, he is longing for the love of a father. He, he has his own identity crisis. Because when you don't have the love of a father and a, and a mom or a mom, parents who don't love you, they have the, well, I love this other kid, not you so much. And a kid grows up going, what? I mean, that does irreparable damage to children. And, and I don't think any of us want to, I don't really, you know, it's worth thinking about today. Do you have favoritism in your life or in your family? We all lean towards the ones that are easier, right? Whether it be friends or in the marketplace or our work workplace do you do you show this kind of favoritism because what happens here is Jacob you might remember Jacob would do whatever he needed to do to get Rachel as his wife you remember that and I think what's going on in his inner heart he's thinking if I could have that beautiful woman she will fix my life because his life is messed up he has not received the blessing of the father who who would fully love him, fully known, fully loved. He has an identity crisis of his his own. So oftentimes we look for that in another person. Some of us are seeking out our possessions or our positions or, or somebody come rescue me. And what we see here, Joseph now, 
He is out there with his brothers. He comes back with a bad report. Now, we don't know what this bad report is, but the language is such. He's snitching on them. That's what he's doing. He, he's, he's coming to say, hey, something's up. He said that there's a self-righteous tattling that's going on. And all parents, um, I'm not going to just talk to all parents here, but uh, there'll be a lot of single folks. But parents know this. Or uh, maybe if you've worked with preschoolers or something, you know, like you'll be in the other room doing something, working, you know, away. Like we had twins, right? And then it's, stop it, Winnie, you know, or whatever. It's, stop, Emily. So that mom or dad will come running in just going, okay, Emily, would you stop that? You know, like you didn't even see what, I did nothing, right? We, but we do that. We cry out like somebody come rest me. Somebody go help me. And that's the language here. What's going on. And then what happens comes a verse that should trigger all kinds of concerns for us in verse three. Now, Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. That's messed up. Because he was the son of his old age. There was, and, and Rachel, she was the, he was the first of Rachel. So all these years go by and finally he has a son with Rachel and he made him a robe of many colors. Now we see this repeated favoritism that Jacob experienced in his own life. He just repeats it with his own sons. And this is a good time to pause and consider what generational patterns do you have in your life? And this is easier for us who are a little adults and a little older, but even a young person, you can ponder this. What generational patterns do you see in your family, in your life that you need to break? And today is the day to break it. To break the patterns of sin or failure or habits that that have been a part of your life. And here's, here's another twist on that. Many people, and numbers are proving this, um, many people are breaking generational patterns that our parents and grandparents had in terms of going to church and being involved in ministry and in the church. Like some of us remember back in the day, those of us who grew up in church, we used to go like four times a week. No, no. I mean, four times a month and then like twice or three times a week. And, and nowadays, eh, I got a lot going on. I got a lot happening. I, it's, it's why, can I say it? It's why I'll, I'll see people at Easter or Christmas going, wow, you're, wait, you're still here. Amazing. Good to see you. Wow. Oh, yeah, we love this church. Hadn't been here in six months, but I love this place. Are you devoted to being in God's house every single week? Or are you breaking a pattern? So your kids are going to go, wasn't a big deal to mom and dad. No, not, not a big deal to me. We see this drift and it's happening. And, and, and many of us, we need to establish patterns. We need to establish new patterns. You need to be, as parents, you need to be in the word every day. Can I say it? Your kids will follow your pattern. They'll develop habits that you have because they've seen you. They, and it's just intuitively. They, they're just going, that means a lot to my parents, that thing. What is it for you? What patterns do you need to, uh, to break? What patterns do you need to instill in your family? And then look at this. We come to the famous coat of many colors. Now, this is actually hard to translate. Um, you probably only have heard of that. But it actually, some scholars say, no, it's really a long-sleeved robe is how you translate that. Others say, no, it's an embroidered robe. But whatever the translation is, it does help us to understand what's going on here. I mean, it's clear how they respond, but... He's getting this favored, we know this, right? He's getting a favored robe where we might say, hey, roll up your sleeves. Let's get some work done, right? They didn't roll up sleeves. A long sleeve robe was not a work robe. This is, he's wearing a suit is what this is. Like, you know, he's coming out here. All his brothers are working hard, maybe even robes off. We're getting after it. Joseph comes in, pretty boy, you know, shows up with his robe on. And everybody knows then that the father is the one. They know he's the one who gave it to him. And so we're, this repeated favoritism, and it is, it's a mess. Uh, this symbolizes and summarizes why his brothers respond in the way they do. Look at verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, it's one thing to have sibling rivalry. They hated him. Think about that. I don't know if you have that going on in your family. Maybe. I I mean, sometimes as families get older and things play out, this is a sad 
place to be here. Three times we see this. Their hatred increases. And if you know where the story goes, I mean, it, it is, it's a serious problem when siblings hate each other. Why do we get to this place? As we'll see, Jacob is passive. Nobody's stepping in to say, not in our family. Parents need to take charge. Your kids many are too young to be the ones in charge. Many of us need to step in and say, we don't talk to each other like that in our family. We do not say this in our family. This does not happen here. And at the beginning of summer, probably a good time to talk about this, right? We're going to be close in together and a lot more maybe than we normally are. But, but, but this, it's just a good moment to talk about your own relationships. Do you have favoritism? And maybe in, maybe in your family. Like, well, no, not really. I love all my kids. That one makes me crazy. But I love all of them. And you might, you might even think, well, favoritism, I mean, really, is, that, is it that big a deal? Because, like, Jeff, don't you, like, have people you really like and good friends more than other people? Listen, James chapter 2, verse 9, it says favoritism is a sin. It is a sin. That is worth pondering. Because every person has been created in the image of God. We're to love every person regardless. And here's the thing. You want, here's the big question, remember? Is maturity in Christ the singular goal in my life? Is that what I'm for in everything? Then watch this. God will use people in your life to help you grow. You ever prayed for, you ever prayed for patience? Right? Your, the children that you have or the people in your life or that person at work makes you crazy. Why has God placed them in your life? So you will grow. Lord, help me grow in kindness. Okay, I'll bring somebody who's not real nice into your life. Lord, I want to grow in patience. Oh, that's dangerous. But if maturity is the goal, you're going to see life this way. Lord, how are you using this precious child that you placed into my family to draw me to become more like you, to develop the fruit of the Spirit in my life? How are you doing this right now? You see, it's a different perspective, friends, altogether. What we see in this family from early on, this favoritism, Jacob's immature, Joseph is immature, flaunting his, you know, his, his, his role, you know, as playing this role as the favor. The hateful brothers are immature. And it's worth pausing for a moment and thinking about how do you need to grow up? This is the challenge that the Spirit is leading us to now. How, how, how do you need to grow up emotionally and spiritually? Because we're holistic people. Pete Scazzaro wrote a book. Some of you may have seen it. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's worth writing down. Uh, and he notes this. Emotional health and spiritual health or maturity are inseparable. Okay. It is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And then, he's, then he, he wrote this as well. I've quoted this before. Jesus may be in your heart, but grandpa's in your bones. And the task of discipleship is to get Jesus more and more into your bones. How does that happen? Discipleship. It happens in the word daily. More of him. It happens in community, as I noted. It's in community that we learn to love each other. It's in community that we, we learn to forgive one another. It's in community that we grow in patience for each other. A lot of people with an supposed, it's a self-righteous maturity that says, well, I don't, want, I don't want to get in that group. Those people are messed up. Well, I was in that, that connect group, but I, I'm just, they're not my people. I don't know. I, well, my kids, we were real involved, but, you know, but then it, things got rocky. And so we have this self-righteous immaturity is what it is. Thinking we're mature. And so it's a real insidious thing. I want you to, and again, you're thinking about yourself because, because, this, this loving God and loving others is, a, is two sides of the same coin. That's the summation of the law, according to Jesus, right? 
And so we see here, there's no restraint. There's no self-control. The, the family is marked by this, this lack of boundaries. And Jacob doesn't limit himself in his favoritism. Joseph doesn't limit himself in his pride and self-adulation. And the brothers don't limit themselves, limit themselves in, in their hatred. Self-imposed limitations reveal maturity. Okay, I'll say it this way. Restraint reveals maturity. A lot of us have a lot of freedom in our culture to do whatever we want to do. Now, now a kid will eat cookies until they are sick, right? If you don't stop them. Adults don't do that. <laughs> adults have freedom. Oh, adults will drink until they're drunk. Adults will binge on Netflix till they're numb. Adults will get on screens or phones until they've just drifted off and they're not even connecting with people. Their own children around them. Adults have freedoms that can really do us in. And I just want to speak. I know I'm saying a lot to families here because this is all about family. But some of us have such a child-centered family that we are just producing the most self-centered, immature kids in the world. They've come to believe it's all about them. Because we're allowing our kids to run the show. And can I say it? Love you. As a pastor, I've seen families who will bow out of church once devoted in deep relationships with other couples. And suddenly their, their kids are like, um, I want to do this. I want to do this. And a lot, of, a lot of parents, driven by their own passions, my kid's going to be in the NBA. He's going to be in the MLB. He's going to be a professional golfer. We got to fuel this stuff. In the most form formative years of their lives, they pull out of church commitment and patterns to go to church. And the kid grows up, eh, scratch golfer, but then it starts to fade and doesn't even matter. And he hasn't grown spiritually at all. And we wonder why we send them off to college and they don't go to church because it's not a big deal. Friends, we have got to stay in. And, and parents, who's running the show in your family? This is a challenge for many of us. What are we teaching our kids about staying in, about persevering, about being mature in Christ and growing in him? Spiritually immature people will regularly fail to limit themselves. And, and, and we've got to teach our kids to do the same. This is what fasting is all about, right? And again, at the beginning of the summer, this is a good time to talk about this. Um, some of us need to fast from technology. You need to lay out the rules here and now because technology, our, our smartphones and such, are keeping us not only driving so many of us to this need of comparison and approval and and all the things, particularly our younger people, but it's also keeping us from the very things that we're, we were created to actually do in real time and with real people. That's where growth and health takes place. When we're with others and we're focused on other people. We teach our kids this often. Listen, freedom is not doing whatever you want to do. Some adults need to hear this. Freedom is doing what you ought to do. Those are two very different things. If you can't do what you ought to do, that's not freedom. That's bondage because of our sin nature. So the question is this. Here it is. The critical issue on my journey with God is not am I happy, but am I free? Am I free from my addictions? Am I free from my bad habits? It's only in discipleship. It's only growing in the context of community in his word. So here's the question. Am I growing in the freedom that I have found in Christ? We're, we're, we, we have freedom in him. We are totally forgiven. A lot of people wrestle with this. So I can do whatever I want? No, 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 no. Not if you understand what he's done for you. All of life is a response. Then it's obedience and worship. Okay? So I spent a lot of time setting this up. And a lot of time on that first point, these next two, rather quickly. Our, our speech reveals our immaturity. Okay. This is probably where it's seen mostly. It's in our speech. Now look at what happens. Now, Joseph had a dream and you know where the story goes. And he told it to his brothers that they, they hated him even more. Okay. They're, they're just hating him more and more. He said to them, hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, that's like, Hey, check this out. We were, and he'll say this over and over again. We were binding sheaves in the field and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. 
And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. His brother said to him, are you indeed intend to, to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him. There it is again. Even more for, the, for his dreams and for his words. For his words. All right. They hated him. What was Joseph thinking? Really? I don't know if you ever considered this part of the story here, because if you know the story, this is kind of where it goes. Like this actually happens. But he's he's naive at best, and he's rubbing it in at worst. I mean, he's just prideful. Check out my robe, guys. You know I'm favored. Let me tell you what's going down. You're gonna bow down to me. Is what's happening. So he's he's playing this as well. Consider your speech. Is it timely? Maybe that's the, does he need to say this now? Not everything that could be said needs to be said, right? Whoo, we see a lot of that in our culture today, but we see it in our relationships too. Consider your own speech. Consider your jokes, your criticisms, your frustrations, all show your immaturity often. It was Johann Goethe, who's the one who said, nothing shows a man's character more than what he laughs at. Notice the marks of immaturity, unrestrained, no limitations, no boundaries. Look, here it is. Discernment reveals maturity. Discernment on when to speak, when to be silent. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the guidance. That's why we got to stay in his word, stay in prayer. Um, James 3 verse 2 says this. You've probably heard this before. For all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man or woman able to bridle his whole body. This word perfect is the word, it literally means has reached its end, full grown. Here it is, mature. If you can control the tongue, it'll play out in every aspect of your life. This is a good time at the beginning of the summer, beginning of this week. Here's the challenge, full on, full summer challenge. Nothing but kind words of uplifting and encouragement to one another. Do it this week. See if you can do it. All right. So our speech reveals our immaturity along with our freedoms. And look at this. Finally, our silence reveals our our immaturity. Silence is what destroys this family. Jacob is nowhere to be found. Look at verse nine. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, behold, I have dreamed another dream. (laughs) Behold, the sun, the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him. Okay, wait, he, okay, good. And said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his fathers kept the saying in mind. Nobody really steps into disciple. Joseph. Nobody intervened. And I know you could say, well, it's actually going to happen. Like he's just telling them what's up. But rather than taking his son under his wing, remember Jacob had dreams. Jacob wrestled with God. He's had experiences with God, but he remains silent is what that last phrase means. Our silence shows our immaturity. Our failure to, to pour truth into others shows our immaturity. Our failure to disciple others shows our immaturity. Again, many of us should already be teaching and guiding and leading others instead of just kind of sitting there silent. And and, and by the way, a church like ours needs everybody on deck. There's a place for you to serve. How is the Lord speaking in your heart? I came to this this week in this passage. No pattern is more painful than passivity. And no betrayal is more subtle than silence. And that's what we're seeing here in this family. And and Jacob is just not stepping up. We we, we need parents to step up. And maybe it's you in, in the lives of others. Maybe it's roommates or friends. And yet some of us are being silent about things that actually really matter. It was Dr. Martin Luther King who said our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter most. Uh, Some of us will express our 
political views or whatever else, and we'll be hyped about the Mavericks, and who's not hyped about the Mavericks? Um, or the stars or whatever else. You'll talk about that all day long. You don't talk about Jesus. You don't talk about what the Lord's doing in your life. You don't talk about things that matter and bring truth to people. Here it is. At, at times, silence reveals our immaturity, but clarity reveals our maturity. Clarity in how we speak. Confusion reigns in a world where the truth is, is not reigning. And spiritually immature people have not received the truth. In Ephesians 4, Paul, he, he says it this way. He says, grow up and then you will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the wind, right? And then he says this in verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we, we okay, will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Friends, who do you need to speak the truth in love to? And don't miss the love piece, relationship. This past week, we read in Dwell a passage out of 1 Corinthians that says, you know, Paul was saying, you're, you were just infants. I, couldn't, I only gave you milk. I couldn't give you solid food. Because some of you, you're following after Paul. You're following after Paulus. And he said, you're just like other people. You're just mere humans, is what he says. Why? Because he's saying, if you're not following after Christ, you're just going to be a mere human. Some of us are following after our favorite common commentators, our favorite whatever, our favorite politicians, our favorite... Who's got a favorite politician? Anyway, um, our, our favorite leaders in our lives, we're following after people, not following after Jesus. Are you truly following him? How do you do that? And you're in his word daily. It's a pattern in your life. You're praying constantly. You're, you're in community. You're devoted to the church and God's people. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says the same thing. He says, I could only give you milk because I, I couldn't give you, I just gave you the basic principles of the oracles of God. I couldn't give you meat because, or solid food because you weren't ready for it. You were not mature. And so I, I'm just asking each of us to consider our own lives, spiritual immaturity. You know, it, it'll, it marks us in many ways, a gullibility to false doctrine. It, 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 it shows us that we don't have deep relationships. We're not accountable to others. There's all kinds of applications here for us. And, and I just want to encourage each of us. Here it is, and myself. I, I've thought about my own life, areas where I'm, I'm immature. I'm going to grow up. And I, and I want to challenge you, grow up. To commit your heart and your life to the fellowship. Some of you need to join the church today. Some of you need to decide you're going to not just sit here on Sundays, but actually serve others. You're going to come and really devote yourself to the Lord and to, the, to His church. Because it's time. Some of you should be teaching others. And instead, you just give me more. Give me more. I'm just an infant. Give me more milk. I'm just, just take it in. Instead, the Lord is calling you to say yes to him and to grow up. Unrestrained freedom. Thoughtless speech. Passive silence. These are the marks of immaturity. And so what I want us to do now is turn our hearts to the Lord we have time to just focus in on him before we go. And uh, let's do this. Let's just let's bow our heads and, and close our eyes. Um, in a moment, we're going to sing a song over you that reminds each of us that the Lord has plans. He has good plans for you. And so just take a deep breath. After all that you have heard and a lot coming at you, and the Spirit has been speaking into your heart. So I want to ask this question, a simple question. Is maturity in Christ the number one goal in your life? How would you know? Again, you'd be in his word. You would pray without ceasing in so many ways. You would be devoted to a local church. You would be serving others. How do you need to grow? In what area of your life has the Spirit revealed that you are immature and it's time to step up? And I know this is hard, but what we want to do now is to pause and remember why we do all that we do. Again, it's not 
10 chapters and five points in each on how we can become mature. It's, it's a story that we find ourselves in of a Savior who's come to rescue us. And as we receive his grace over and over again, just to say, yes, Lord, remind me again, remind me again, remind me again of how much you love me. I give you my life all over again. I can't do this without you. Let that be your prayer now. He has good plans for you. He is your loving shepherd. He is guiding you, and he is not giving up on you. Don't you give up on him. So I want us to continue to pray, and our ushers are going to come and serve us the elements of the Lord's Supper. So continue to pray and ponder how much God loves you and what he's calling you to do in these days.